Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praises due to Allah. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves us say, none can show Him guidance. May there be peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of our program, Ask Huda. Allow me to remind you with our phone numbers and the contact informations in the beginning of this uh, uh, episode. Area code 002 then 02 332. Alternatively, area code 002 then 01005469323. WhatsApp numbers area code 001347806025. Finally, another WhatsApp number area code 001361489150. And we're live on my Facebook page, M Salah Official, as well as on the YouTube channel which should appear on the bottom of the screen for the reminder. We'll be more than happy to start collecting your calls and concerns. Also, if you have any questions, you can post it at the comment bar on my page. Uh, allow me to begin with the sister Mary Oli. Mary who says, It was reported that it is recommended to recite Surah Al-Mulk before going to bed. Can one instead recite the Surah after Isha or should be recited with the Adhkar before uh, sleeping? Uh, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated a hadith. In this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said, one chapter which consists of 30 uh, ayahs, 30 verses, interceded for the man who used to recite it on a regular basis, until he was forgiven all his sins. This chapter, the Prophet ﷺ said, it is Surah Al-Mulk. This hadith is collected by Imam Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood and others. Uh, it is a sound hadith as well. In another narration by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he narrated that whoever recites Surah Al-Mulk on every night, it will protect him against the torment of the grave. And he said at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we used to call it the Mani'ah or the preventive uh, surah. So whether you recite it before going to sleep or you recite it in the evening, uh, it will do it insha'Allah. Uh, most important thing is that you should remember to recite it uh, on every night. Barakallahu fikum. Um, Sakib Yaqub is asking, I want a clarification on the prayer while traveling. Sakib says that I live in Ajman, I travel around 130 kilometers to my workplace and I stay one day there at uh, my workplace, then I come back after the next day. After completing my duty for two days means 4.30 a.m. I start from home. I reach at 6.30. Okay, 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 okay. What should I shorten my prayer or not? Because I got mixed opinions. My dear brother and all the viewers, if you're away from home, whether for work or for leisure, as long as the place that you go, even if you go to on regular basis or even on daily basis, as long as this is not your residence, this is not where you and your family live at. So this is the place of suffer or journey. If it is the travel distance according to the vast majority of the scholars, which is uh, approximately 83 kilometers, the Farasikh, then you're eligible to shorten your prayer. And furthermore, you're eligible to combine the two prayers which share the same time together at the time of either one of them. So, not because you go to this, uh, to this workplace on a daily basis or you go and you stay there two days and come back to stay in your uh, residence for two days, that means you spend equal time here and there. No, 
where you and your family actually live. This is your residence. So in this case, whenever you try you travel for work, you're eligible to shorten the prayer. And by the way, you begin shortening the prayer soon as you leave the city limit in which you live. Even though it's not even uh, uh, 15 kilometers yet, but once you left, you're traveling already. The travel distance will be so much equal to either three or more. Then once you leave your city limit, you can go ahead and start and shorten your prayer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dilhaq, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, welcome to the program. Go ahead. Okay, you want to try again? Dilhaq, we cannot hear you. As there is actually a lot of static. Okay, try again, please. Salim from the USA. Assalamu alaikum, Salim. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I would like to ask a question. It's for my friend. So uh, he got married. He did istakhara and everything came out well and he got married. And now uh, he has been divorced. Uh, so I want to know if he did istakhara and if Allah had granted some good dream or you know some positive result, why did he end up getting divorced? What is the reasoning behind this? Jazakallah khairan. Okay. Thank you, Brother Salim from the USA. That's a very valid question. If I pray istikhara, I'm supposed to have everything done perfect and the outcome should be absolutely perfect. Well, this is number one if that is the result of istikhara. Many of us pray istikhara as a routine. So pray istikhara while I've already made up my mind like, I like the girl, I like her family, I'm dying to marry her, or the girl is dying to marry you. So somebody said, pray istikhara. Yes, I'll pray istikhara. And perhaps the istikhara is not really uh, done properly. I'm just praying istikhara, but I have made up my mind. I've taken the decision. Al-istikhara and al-istishara should be done in the process of making of the decision, not finalizing, like I've, we've got already engaged or I paid the dowry, I booked the hall, um, I'm in love with her. Then I prayed istikhara. So guess what? Even when you see a dream, what you see isn't really the, uh, some sort of inspiration. Rather, it is called hadith nafs because you are actually daydreaming of her and she's daydreaming of him or her. Um, uh, I mean, if the person were to pray istikhara properly, before having made up the final decision, then Allah's choice is most definitely the most perfect for him. The most perfect for him. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Um, Sister Munira is asking, being a woman, can I go to see my mother at a graveyard and make dua there? There is a big controversy about it. So many are saying that women cannot go there, but is it authentic? Well, as you say, there is a difference of opinion, but I wouldn't escalate it or raise it to the level of controversy because it is simply an opinion which says, no, women are not supposed to go to the graveyard, period. Uh, because since the Prophet Sallallahu forbade them, and he forbade men as well, those who said it is permissible with conditions. They rely on some references. Based on those references, I adopt this view. And I say, if a woman were to go to the graveyard in order to give salam and make dua for a deceased person, let it be a husband, a father, a son, a brother, or whoever, or a sister, as long as she is going in the right time, wearing the proper hijab, giving salam as the Prophet Sallallahu taught us, men and women, making dua to Allah to have mercy on the person who is in the grave, not the other way around, not communicating with the person and asking him or her for help, 
then she's like uh, men exactly in that respect. And here are some of the references, brothers and sisters. Number one, when Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, O Prophet of Allah, whenever I visit the graveyard, what shall I say? So he taught her the supplication which we as men, men and women are alike, we recite it. We say, Assalamu alaikum ahl al diyari min al mu'mineen wal muslimin wa inna insha Allah bikum lahiqoon nas'alu Allah lana wa lakum al afiyah. I know some of the viewers would ask, what does it mean? Peace be with you, the dwellers of these homes, of the believers and Muslims. And soon, God willing, we will join you. We ask Allah to pardon us and to pardon you. So who asked this uh, question? It was Aisha radiallahu anha. And what was the response of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He taught her what to say whenever she visits the graveyard. So this is one question. He could have said, oh no, you're not allowed to go to the graveyard, Aisha. But he didn't. Okay? We'll discuss another reference, inshallah, after this call. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah. Father Muhammad from the case say, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask Wada. Assalamu alaikum. Say, how are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Brother Muhammad. How about yourself, nice Akhi? Alhamdulillah, say, Alhamdulillah. Nice to hear from you. You are doing a fantastic job, say, you know, lots of uh, people, uh, you know, who is knowing uh, Islam uh, proper way and it's a good job. Let Allah bless you and your family ameen, and ameen, the whole Muslim Same in the you, world. Uh, say, Same to you. Jazakallah uh, khairan. Muhammad from the case. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, say, I have one question. You know, um, say, I said, I, I, I heard that, you know, Faral and, uh, uh, say, Faral, Faral prayer, we have only one Mia. But... Can I combine um, the, uh, you know, any other sunnah prayer with uh, um, uh, the, um, what is that, uh, the tawbah prayer, tawbah, tawbah, the tawbah sunnah uh, prayer can be combined with any other uh, sunnah prayer? Okay, that's a good question. Got your question. That's only one thing. Yeah. Shukran, say, shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Irfana from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Irfana. Welcome back. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Uh, mm. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Sister Irfana. Go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, I have two questions today. The first question is, mm. um, I have learned that uh, our duas get accepted uh, at the time in between Adan and Ikhama. Now, uh, since we pray at home, uh, so how do we as how do we know that uh, when is the time for ikhama and what is the best time for us to make dua? Uh, so is it like, should we uh, do ikhama by ourselves and pray? Uh, so kindly clarify this for me. And my second question is, uh, as you have said, uh, the, the best names um, are Abdullah and Abdurrahman. I would like to know what are the best names for uh, girls, the baby girls. So if you can... Uh, Give me some suggestions. All right. Thank you, Sister Afana from India. Assalamu alaikum. Abdul Mujib from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Abdul Mujib. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Wada, brother. Go ahead. Uh, my question is um, about. Um, network marketing. Yes. Any other questions? Network marketing. I, I got the question. Do you have another one? No. I want. Uh, I want to explain more network marketing. All right. Actually, it's um, this company. They sell um, uh medicines that benefits so they ask you to invest and you market for them abdul mujib to be honest with you your you second with me, question Sheikh? is not really clear can you repeat your second question please it's, uh, it's still i'm still on the first question well i got the first question i'm i'm fully aware of it if you have another question go ahead and present it all right i have no question Okay, thank you. Got Brother Anas from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask Wada. Wa 
وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Our Sheikh, how are you? I'm doing great. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Anas, could you mute your TV, sir, please? Okay, okay, okay. Yes. So, uh, my Sheikh, our Sheikh, my, my question is, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, I was, I mean, uh, in a social media, we talk, we, we young boy, uh, we talk with a girl, I know, like, you know, friend, and we just take each other on Messenger, on the side, like this, and we always, uh, I mean, we talk, we talk with a girl on social media, so, is it, Haram, or is it alone according to our religion or not? No. This is my question, my sheikh, our sheikh. Got your question, Anas from Egypt. Thank you. All right. So um, the second hadith I'm referring to is when the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, was at the graveyard and he observed a woman who was making some awful remarks due to the loss of her son. So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon her, addressed her saying that, O slave of Allah, fear God and be patient. So she said, leave me alone. You have no clue what I've been through. So the Prophet ﷺ left her. Then when he went home, she was told that it was the messenger of God. So she ran to his house and a conversation went on between them and he said, sorry, I didn't recognize you. He said, don't worry about that. Indeed, patience is observed at the first shock. Okay, but he never said, you know what? You're not supposed to go to the graveyard. So that's why I say, if a woman is going to visit somebody at the graveyard, to take heed, to remember death, and to benefit like men exactly, or to pray for a relative, a dead person at the graveyard. She's wearing her proper hijab. She's feeling secure. She's not wearing any perfume or makeup. That is permissible, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sadia from the USA, Sister Sadia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, brother. Uh, my first question is. Um, is it okay to keep the Quran in the clo in the area that you change your clothes? Okay, you mean in the closet? Okay. Second question: In, in the, the closet, yes. Will you change your clothes? Okay. Okay, and the second question is: Allahumma uh, inni asaluka hubbak. Is that an authentic uh, dua to ask for Allah's love? Okay. Thank you, brother. Assalamu alaikum. You're most welcome, Sister Saadia. Barakallahu feekah. Assalamu alaikum. Abdul Haq from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Yeah, go ahead, Abdul Haq. Dear Shaykh. Yep. Go ahead. Can I hear me? Yes, I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Shaikh, I have two questions. First is, mm. is it halal to eating the uh, kangaroo and ostrich? And my second question is, the, is it permissible to do business with uh, farming like crocodile or snake? <laughs> You're really working in a zoo, Abdul Haq, mashallah. Have okay. you got my question? Yeah, I got your questions, Abdul Haq from Bangladesh. But I'm not familiar that you got kangaroos in, uh, in Bangladesh. You know, in Australia you may be, but in uh, Bangladesh. But anyway, I'll answer your question, inshallah, in the same order it was received. Brother Muhammad from the KSA asked a very interesting question. Combining two acts of worship as far as the prayers, and it is not far, it is not mandatory, it's rather sunnah. <coughs> Praying one prayer with two different intentions. This is what we call it tashrik or overlapping of the intentions in the same act of worship. It's permissible if one of them is not intended for itself for a specific uh, prescription or reason. Let me give you an example. 
whenever we enter the mosque, it is recommended not to sit down before praying. As a matter of fact, in the sound hadith, which is agreed upon its authenticity, whenever you enter the masjid, you should not sit down before praying. Praying what? Maybe praying the fard, maybe praying the nafila before or after. And if there is no prayer whatsoever, then do not sit down until you offer the two rakahs, the greeting for the masjid. Like in the case of Jumu'ah, you enter when the Imam is giving the speech, do not sit down before praying these two independent rakahs with the intention of what? Tahiyatul Masjid or the greeting of the Masjid. But what if I enter after the Adhan is called and uh, now I have the option of praying the two rakahs, Tahiyatul Masjid, or the two or the four rakahs of the Sunnah before Dhuhr or before Fajr. What shall I do? Well, if you pray the two rakahs, the Sunnah before Fajr, it will do it for both. So the overlapping of the intention here is perfectly fine. Because as far as the sunnah for the greeting of the masjid is not an independent prescription like, you know, it's only because you've entered the masjid, you should not sit down before you pray. So there, I'm praying. Another nafila. So that is permissible. Likewise, it's recommended after performing wudu to offer two rakas. So I've made wudu and I enter the masjid or I'm ready to pray the sunnah before Dhuhr or before Asr or before Maghrib or Isha. So I prayed the Sunnah. Can I combine the two intentions in one uh, in one worship, which is the two rakahs? Yes, that is permissible. But somebody, for instance, has forgotten or did not get to pray the two rakahs, the Sunnah before Fajr. And then he was sitting in the Masjid after Fajr, recited his Adhkar, recited his Qur'an, until the morning, until the forenoon, and he's ready to pray the Duha, two rakahs. So can he pray the two rakahs with the intention of making up the Sunnah before Fajr and the two rakahs for Duha? Nope. These are two different prescriptions, two different acts of worship. So there is no overlapping in them. It's like, you know, praying Dhuhr and Asr. Not because you miss Dhuhr, you pray four rakahs and you intend to pray both. It doesn't work. So this ibadah with a separate intention. Now, whenever you commit a sin, it's a sound hadith as well, and you pray two rakahs, two units, with full khushua, they're known as the tawbah prayer, or seeking forgiveness prayer, then the sin will be as if it never taken place. Can I make wudu and I pray, it was sunnah to wudu, or it was already the two rakahs before Fajr. Will that do it? Yes, it will do it. And the two rakahs will be a means of expiation for the sin which was committed before it. Barakallah feek, Muhammad from the KSA. Irfana from uh, India. Um, supplicating between Adana and Iqama is one of the very precious times, especially if you are in the masjid. If you are waiting for the salah because in the sound hadith, وَلَا يَزَالُ فِي صَلَاةٍ مَا دَامَتْ تَحْبِصُهُ الصَّلَاةِ So long as you're sitting in the masjid, waiting for the prayer to be established, then this time is actually a time of a prayer. You are being rewarded for it, and the meter of good deeds is counting good deeds as if you're actually praying, because why am I sitting for 20, 25 minutes between Adhan and Iqama, waiting for the prayer, so you still get the same reward. A woman who prays at home after Adhan and before praying yourself, make supplication, supplicate to Allah. This is a precious time as well, even if you don't hear the Iqamah. A woman is not recommended, nor she required to call Adhan, nor call Iqamah. So when you hear the Adhan in the masjid and before you pray, you can pray your Sunnah, they can make, then you can make your supplication as much as you want then you offer your prayer. Beautiful names for girls. There are some beautiful names in the Quran, beautiful names in the Sunnah. And uh, the first thing I think about whenever my wife is pregnant and we know that it's a girl, oh, the daughters of the Prophet وسلم, or any of his wives, the names of the lady companions. Well, this is the, the first thing that crosses my mind. We know that, that the Prophet ﷺ said the, the, uh, the, the leaders of all the women in Paradise, Khadija, Fatima, 
Maryam, uh, Maryam bint Imran and uh, Asiya bint Muzahim. So any of those names are beautiful. Um, I've named uh, my daughter Ruqayyah and I love the name Ruqayyah, the name of uh, the Prophet's daughter, radiyallahu anha. And also when you choose a name, you choose a name which is easy to write, easy to say, easy at the airport to handle, you know. So in the Quran, in Surah Al-Mutafifin, there is a beautiful Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back and our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of the screen for the reminder. Sister Fawziya from the USA, Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry, from the UK, Sister Fawziya. See Brother Salah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking Sister Fawziya. Go ahead please. It's great to hear you brother. Uh, today I have three questions to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, the first question is basically I have left uh, uh, lots of my further fast in my uh, younghood, in my young age, teenage, and I don't know how many were they. So how would I cover them up? Do I have to keep all of them or how would I count them more or less? I'm very not sure about it that how would it work? And then... Uh, Second question is, uh, sorry, what was the second question? About Salah, yes. So when we pray, I heard that, uh, actually from one of your video, I got to know that after fourth prayer, doing dua with raising hand is, uh, is a bidda. And uh, I was very confused about it because uh, I, as, I, as far as I know that after first Salah, doing dua is, uh, is very liked. Plus, when you raise the hand, uh, while you're doing dua is also light. So this is my second question. And uh, sorry, are you listening? Yes, I am. I just don't want to interrupt you. Okay. Yes. And so third question is, is on my friend, is, is on behalf of my friend. Basically, um, she been married to somebody and uh, it, it was completely a betrayed marriage. I mean, the guy told her something and later on actually he was completely different person. He had no status, like job-wise and everything. He completely was different person. And she is not happy about it. So she decided to separate. Well, um, now she's asking that guy, uh, that man to divorce, but uh, he is not giving her divorce. So, so there are two questions. First, would she get sin if she asked for a hula or something? Uh, because she doesn't want, she never wanted a guy like that, and what he told her was completely different. And the second question here is, uh, she, if she goes for hula, uh, it takes a while in UK, so uh, it takes really long, like six months, I guess, to do hula. Is there any other way she can, uh, you know, she can be, uh, she can have divorce from him or hula or something like that? Uh, I mean, if you just tell. Yeah, your question, to... Sister Fawziya from the UK. Thank you so much. Um, so we're done with Irfana from India. And now Abdul Haq from uh, Abdul Majid from Nigeria. Network marketing is absolutely forbidden and it's a big scam. And it's not based on an interest of buying a product because you really need it or marketing a product because you really sell it it's rather a beneficiary business. So bottom line, no, it is not permissible to get involved in the pyramid marketing business. Regular marketing, if you, do, you take this as a profession and you market any goods which you give and you provide its full details and description with full honesty is absolutely permissible if the goods or the merchandise are permissible to sell. But the pyramid marketing uh, scheme is not permissible. Anas from Egypt, uh, conversing with girls on the social media. Look, Anas, today in this episode, I had uh, Fawziya from the UK, I had another sister from the USA, Saadia from the USA, Irfana from India, and many sisters from different countries. We're conversing. What kind of conversation? Proper conversation. 
And when you go to a doctor, maybe she's a lady. Uh, the pharmacist, maybe she's a lady. Uh, the teacher at the school, uh, a lady. All of that is okay as long as the conversation is within something uh, legal, needed, you know, not personal. Now we're getting into a personal matter, exchanging photos, pictures, family matters, and what do you like to eat, what are you going tonight, all of that, this is none of your business. You know, I would never allow my wife to chat with a man who, uh, you know, he has nothing to do with our life. You know, he, who, who is he? Who are you to this girl? A friend? There is no such friendship. So if, inshallah, when you get married, if you're not married, if you don't like your wife to chat with somebody on the social media, let me see, you, oh, and you're laughing. What is going on? Because my friend just uh, cracked the joke. Who's your friend? A guy? You know? This is totally un-Islamic. That's not acceptable. And it's not acceptable for your sister, for your mom, for your wife, for your daughter. You know, you wouldn't be happy about it. So accordingly, never allow yourself to chat with a girl unnecessarily, whether on social media, whether on the, any of these means. You know, the social media is such a blessing, but meanwhile, it's a curse for others. Do not take it as a curse, take it as a blessing. Learn, benefit, share good uh, subjects and good materials, good advices, you know, but chatting unnecessarily with girls who are not, uh, you know, you're mahram, she's not your wife, she's not your daughter, she's not your sister, so why would you talk to her? Do not talk to her, please, okay? And when you say, it's just like, you know, chatting, you know, just chatting begins with just chatting, then it ends up with meeting, exchanging photos, one thing leads to another. Check out what Allah says in Surah An-Nur, verse number 31, when Allah the Almighty commanded both the believing men and the believing women in two consecutive verses. He says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبَصَارِهِمْ Command the believing men to lower some of their gaze. You know, you don't have to turn a blind eye all the time. Lower some of your gaze. From whom do not look at a woman or the beauty or the zina of a woman who's not lawful for you. She's not your wife. She's not your sister, neither is she your daughter. Why do you look at her? Why do you check her out? So when you do that, it leads to the following. It leads to chastity. That leads to that. But when you don't do that, that leads to hmm, absence of chastity and modesty. It leads to zina. You know, whether physically, actually, or as the Prophet sallallahu said, the eye commits zina, and the tongue commits zina, and the hearing commits zina by listening to what Allah has forbidden, by talking about what Allah has forbidden in this context. May Allah guide us to what is best. Abdul Haq uh, from Bangladesh, eating the kangaroo meat. You know, when we name any animal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in the Quran that what is forbidden, and besides that, it's haram. So it is not one of the wild animals. It is not one of those animals with canines which devour or eat, uh, you know, uh, meat. Wild, uh, like, you know, we call them siba or wild animals. No. Then it's not, it's not forbidden. Listen to what I said. Uh, now when I say it's not forbidden, there is no prohibition. It's not listed in, in an ayah, nor in a hadith or a Quran. This is such a reference here. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden for us as far as eating the dead, the blood, the swine flesh, and the meat of an animal which died to do suffocation or who fell of a high place, or it was killed by any of the means of hitting, electrocuting, congesting, suffocating, you know. Uh, whenever a sabu, uh, those wild animals, devour or eat an animal, you cannot eat out of it because it's dead as well. Whatever was slaughtered uh, for other than Allah the Almighty, then you cannot eat out of it. So the Congo meat is not listed among that. The Prophet ﷺ listed also some animals which we do not eat, such as uh, al-humur, al-ahliya, the domestic donkeys. So we avoid that, that's haram. So it is not one of those animals which are forbidden for us to eat. Does it mean that you, you know, the sheikh or whoever is saying, go ahead and eat it? 
It doesn't mean that whatsoever. The Prophet وسلم, saw one of the companions eating a lizard meat. He did not eat out of it. So he said, is it haram? He said, no, but I don't eat it. So maybe others eat it. Is it halal? It's halal. It's not haram. With regards to your second question, raising crocodiles and snakes and uh, all of those animals. You know, the Prophet وسلم, named certain hawam and uh, dangerous creatures and creatures which carry contagious diseases. He named the mouse, the stray dog would play. He named the snakes. He said they should be killed. Okay, but as a physician, as a medical student, as a researcher, we need the snakes. We need to uh, extract the poison and make an antidote out of it. That's permissible. Yes, you can have a farm to raise the snakes for this reason. Okay, and the rats likewise for experiments, for anatomy, for you know, for tests, for medical tests, all of that is permissible. But for the purpose of, like some people like to keep in their uh, houses huge snakes. I visited uh, one person before and he showed me the, how many snakes they have. Why? He said, like pets. People like to have cats. People like to have dogs. Or puppies, we, have, we like to have, <laughs> they have an alligator and they have snakes. No, that is not permissible. You know what's the difference? Okay. Uh, the crocodile meat, according to the vast majority of the scholars, it is forbidden. Only according to Imam Malik, it is permissible. And the more right view in this regard is uh, the opinion of the vast majority of the scholars. I think we have some time to answer Sister Fauzia's questions from the UK. She asked that she have missed a lot of mandatory fasting in her life in the past. She doesn't remember how many days, but there are many. What is she supposed to do? If a person was praying but did not fast, so the person is Muslim. And in this case, you remember one Ramadan, two Ramadans, two, three Ramadans, or total 60 days, 70 days, then you must make them up. The Almighty Allah says in the course of the ayat talking about fasting, مَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ So whether the person is sick or traveling, you're allowed to skip fasting during this time, but you got to make it up later. What about if the person actually was neither sick nor traveling and deliberately skipped fasting? So there is a kafara. If the person have violated the fasting due to uh, having sexual relations, oh, that requires fasting for two consecutive months in addition to making up the day. So making up the missed fasting is obligatory as well. Somebody would say, but even if I make it up, it's never the same. I agree. I couldn't, but agree. But you still have to make it up in addition to seeking forgiveness. Qada'ul fawa'id. So you estimate how many days. Keep in mind that, that the, ma the fasting which you missed before reaching the age of puberty, you don't have to make it up. Because it becomes only obligatory upon a Muslim to observe fasting and to offer the prayer on a regular basis whenever he or she reaches the age of puberty. So let's say that at the age of 13, 15, and how many Ramadans you did not fast until uh, you started, alhamdulillah, practicing three, four, um, that's 120 days. Okay, maybe inshallah every Monday and Thursday, you fast with the intention of making up those days. May Allah accept. Second question, making dua after the salah. No, I remember very well that since 15, 16 years, since we started presenting this program, I said when a person makes dua after the prayer, it's permissible. What is not prescribed is when the Imam does the dua in, the con in congregation on regular basis after every salah. Because by that he is making it seem like it's a part of the salah, which is not. Because the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, never ever done so. So it can be categorized as an innovation. But I make dua after the salah. And I raise my hands while making dua after the salah. 
raising the hands only in uh, whenever the khatib of the Jumu'ah speaker is giving the speech. Then he concludes by making dua. You say, I mean, but you don't raise the hands. Why? Because it was not reported and the companions confirmed that this is a time where you don't raise your hands. You may say, I mean, while the Imam is supplicating. But otherwise, after the prayer and uh, upon breaking your fast or any time raising the hands during supplicating is actually uh, a sunnah. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, the third question, we ran out of time, but I will try to wrap it up quickly. Her friend got married to somebody who deceived her with, in respect of his qualities, his job, his income, etc. And by the end, she realized that she married somebody who is totally uh, somebody else. Now she wants a divorce or a khola. Is she blameworthy? No, she is not. If he deceived you, Again, any question pertaining to business, pertaining to marital relations, a husband and wife, I am answering an unknown person. I don't know who is the questioner. So maybe the husband on the other line is watching and he says, no, you know, you give a fatwa. I did not give a fatwa for you. I did not give a judgment. This is a fatwa and there is a big difference between a fatwa and answer to a question which suits the question. The question could be totally not correct fake and it could be absolutely correct so the answer is to fit the question not necessarily the reality which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about it so now if a woman married somebody who introduced himself as I'm a doctor I make 200 grains every year I have a clinic here and there and this is my car and then when she married him she found him nothing nothing none out of that he's not even graduated yet He's not in, even in a medical school. Does she have the right to ask for uh, fasq? Yes. And guess what? Khula is when she does not find any errors in him, but she wants out. You know, she, she cannot tolerate live with him. But in this case, she keeps her entire dowry and she keeps all her rights because the man was a cheater. So the judge would uh, actually do something called fasq. He would separate them and uh, you would ask her, you keep all the uh, benefits that you've taken from him. Gold, silver, that if he give you anything to begin with, in addition to the dowry and so on. Uh, brothers and sisters, the process of getting married is not really something like, you know, um, going out or dating. This is planning for a lifetime journey. And that's why one has to be very careful. And that's why the Sharia, an Islamic law required the consent of the guardian because it is a guardian who's going to investigate, to check out the background of the person, to find out about his relatives, his family. He will go to his work and find out and he's free from those emotions. He's not biased. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to what is best. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم Sister Saadiyah from the USA, I'm so sorry. Keeping the Quran in the closet, it's okay. Making the supplication, Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuk wa hubba kulla amalin yuqarribuni min hubbik. Even if it is not authentic, it's a supplication. So it is okay to supplicate such beautiful supplication. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech